Micah chapter 4. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised up above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law. Even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. And then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. And never again will they train for war. And if Chuck Hagel is correct, this world is exploding what he just said I guess it was yesterday the globe is exploding around us he's right I've not seen this in my lifetime what we used to describe as hot spots or an occasional war or battle or skirmish here or there it just seems like it is global and the intensity amps up that doesn't excite me or thrill me except for the fact that the birth pangs seem to be closer together which means that the one who can accomplish all things and bring this world finally to a place of peace, I believe it's just around the corner. Now we are a third of the way into Micah's second of three messages. He launches into this. I can't read Micah chapter 4 verses 1, 2, and 3 or Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2, 3, and 4 without getting a little excited because this is just good stuff. It's such an encouraging promise. I don't care where we are in life, how your day was, how your week was, or how this year is going for you. Okay, I care, but it doesn't matter when you come to the mountain of the house of the Lord. When you realize what is being said here, that this mountain will be established, it will be raised above the hills, and God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't say it and then not do it. And so what we read here is an absolute promise. Micah arrives at chapter 4 at the apex of the prophecy. We'll go a little higher to get to about midway through or five verses into chapter 5. And that is the pinnacle of the whole thing. But we are here on the mountain of Micah, if you want to call it that, Mount Micah. The place where he really is wanting to go, desiring to go, where the Spirit is leading him as he prophesies to the people of Israel and Judah. Remember, he's prophesying to all the 12 tribes, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom alike. And here, as you may have picked up, word for word, Micah confirms the same written testimony of Isaiah, who was alive at the same time, prophesying at the same time, major prophet, minor prophet, perhaps, uh, you know, mentor and protege. But Isaiah wrote the same exact words, literally word for word. Verses 1 through 3 here is verses 2 through 4 in Isaiah chapter 2. And I thought about that. That's interesting. I mean, it is an exact copy, an exact repeat, or perhaps not a repeat, that Micah and Isaiah, comparing notes in the Spirit, get the same thing and both decide we both need to write this. This is doubly good. This needs to be heard more than once. And I'm reminded that the Torah law teaches us, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And so what you have here in these three verses are Micah and Isaiah, what we could call witnesses of Zion. Witnesses of the kingdom, witnesses confirming the coming of the mountain of the house of the Lord. Two witnesses, and if that weren't enough... The Lord doesn't stop there. They are not alone. The biblical promise of the coming kingdom, of the mountain of the house of the Lord, of Zion in the future is so profoundly significant. It's not just confirmed by one or by two, but by multiple witnesses throughout the Bible. You can't get away from this. And if you've been with us studying through the scriptures, you have seen this again and again. Over and over, this confirmation. In fact, broken down this way, every major section of the Tanakh bears witness to the kingdom. 
the Tanakh. What's, what's the Tanakh? You Bible students know the Tanakh is the Hebrew Scriptures. It's just an easy way to remember the Tanakh, which is the Torah, Ta, the Nevaim, which means the prophets, Na, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings, Tanakh. And that's where it comes from. That's where the name comes from. If you look first at the Torah, first five books of the Scriptures, Torah law, all the way back to Genesis 49, verse 10, Old Jacob said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Speaking, of course, of the Savior, Messiah, Jesus. But he goes on, and it's the second half of the verse that caught my attention this week. And to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. That's a millennial promise. So we're all the way back in Genesis for that one. Exodus 15, verse 17. After the Red Sea is parted. Moses is celebrating and he calls out, You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, and the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And Moses wasn't talking about Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. The, the place of the giving of the tablets. He was talking about the mountain that would house the sanctuary of God. How could he possibly know that? He's a prophet. Well, did he know that he knew? I don't think he probably did. He may have even been thinking, oh yeah, Mount Sinai. But the Lord knew what he was saying. And the Lord was getting this message across loud and clear. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 19, they will call peoples to the mountain. And there they will offer righteous sacrifices. And they will draw out the abundance of the seas from the, and the hidden treasures of the sand. Speaking again of the mountain that is in the land, in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, that would be the mountain of the house of the Lord. So already in the first five books of the Bible, and you see it more than those three times, those are just three quick examples for you. From Jacob to Moses, the kingdom is already being set into the hearts of men, even before they can comprehend what exactly that means. That's in the Torah. How about the Nevi'im? The second section of the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophets. Well, the prophets are replete with information about the kingdom, about the coming house of the Lord, about Zion. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 4. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah as well, and they will go along weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord their God they will seek. They will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They, it, they will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. Now, mind you, Jeremiah wrote that after the northern kingdom had been destroyed for over a hundred years. And he says the sons of Israel will join themselves with the sons of Judah. And Jeremiah is watching as Judah is being completely decimated by Babylon. Ezekiel. Huh. If anyone's talking about the kingdom, Ezekiel is. We just went through that. Chapter 40, 41, 42, and 43 give this epic view of the coming kingdom and of Mount Zion itself. Ezekiel 43, verse 12, just one verse out of that section. This is the law of the house. Its entire area on the top of the mountain all around shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Every one of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, I would throw in there, although he's put in a different place in the Hebrew scriptures in the Tanakh, but every one of them speak of the kingdom. Every one of them describe it at some point as a mountain. Every one of them are Zionists. And the minor prophets come along. And we find them speaking the same things. Again, the confirmation of the word of the Lord, not Pastor Rick's theology, but of the word of the Lord, Obadiah who we think was the oldest minor prophet back in around 840. He wrote in Obadiah 21, the deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Up we go, Mount Zion. And toward the end, Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 3, thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. So that's Torah. Now we're in the Nevi'im, the prophets. And then you get to the third section of the Hebrew scriptures. And they keep talking about Zion, the Ketuvim, the writings. 
Psalm 2, verse 6, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Psalm 68, verse 16, Why do you look with envy, O mountains with many peaks, Mount Baker? You know? Why do you, why do you envy, twin sisters? Why do you envy, Mount Rainier? At the mountain which God has desired for his abode. Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. David was a big time Zionist, more so than Theodore Herzl. David comes along 39 times in the Psalms. He refers directly to, he names Zion. Talking about that ridge, Mount Moriah, there in Jerusalem. And you go to the New Testament. And you, go, you don't get very far. In fact, Jesus just takes his first step into the public ministry and the first words out of his mouth, mouth are, repent, the kingdom is at hand. And then it's kingdom, 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 kingdom. That's all Jesus is talking about. And in Matthew 24, 14, he says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Paul heard him picks up on this whole concept. Romans 11.26 All Israel will be saved just as it is written the Deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And Paul is quoting Isaiah 59 verse 20 there. I know I'm nailing you with a lot of verses right out of the gate but you've got to understand this. That what Micah is going to tell us tonight is supported across the board in the scriptures. Both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Peter wrote, For this is contained in Scripture. And then he quotes Isaiah. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. You know, I love that verse because it reminds me there is no disappointment in Jesus. We may wonder at times. We may have to wait. We may, you know, get a little impatient. But there is no disappointment in Jesus Christ. And finally, in the Revelation, John even gives us a first listen to the number one song on the Kingdom of Zion hit parade. It is the song of Moses and the Lamb, and it goes like this. Revelation 15, verse 3. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And that is a truth that we will see happen in the kingdom. From one end of the Bible to the other, the testimony is given. The question is, what do you think? Esoteric metaphor or actual kingdom? Now, I might have said metaphor 20 years ago when I'd only heard one verse here or perhaps a smidgen there. But you cannot miss the actuality of this when you go through the scriptures. The kingdom's coming, my friends. And it is a guarantee as real as the first coming of Jesus. So will be the second coming and his kingdom. Micah chapter 4, verse 1. It will come about, he says in the last days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. As the chief of the mountains, it will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Just two things to note here. A little preposition. It's the word as. It says the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Literally, that word is be in the Hebrew. The word is on. And read that way, it can also be translated in. It's a little preposition. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established on the chief of the mountains. What does that mean? The chief of mountains is Mount Moriah, that ridge running through Jerusalem. The mountain of the house of the Lord is the temple complex, which itself, by itself, is described as a mountain upon a mountain. Why would he describe it that way? Well, it's a massive edifice. We talked about this in Ezekiel. The temple complex is huge. It is the size of roughly 13 football fields. Just where the temple is sitting, atop Mount Moriah. Well, how can Mount Moriah hold that? I've seen Mount Moriah, and it's somewhat of of a narrow ridge. Oh, there's going to be changes. And the Bible's very clear about that. 
massive topographical changes are going to occur during the tribulation. And when the, the mountain of the house of the Lord, the temple complex, is finally set upon Mount Moriah, everything's going to be different. And it's going to be big. Ezekiel defined the temple complex as 765,625 square feet. That's the size of this. It dwarfs the areas of both the first and the second temples. Micah and Isaiah concur it will come about in the last days. But that's the second thing to note here. In the last days is literally the end of days. It's Be'akarit Hayamim, the end of days in the Hebrew. And I make that distinction because we're in the last days right now. The Bible teaches this. The New Testament uh, writers taught this, that they were in the last days 2,000 years ago. The last days began with the times of the Gentiles. And so this has been a 2,000 period of the last days. The last because it's on the tail end of, of the history of the world. It's not the last days of the church that Mike is talking about here. It's the end of days for Israel. In other words, and note this, it takes place after the 70th week of Daniel. For those of you who have studied Daniel. It takes place after the time of Jacob's trouble. It takes place after the seven years of tribulation as defined in Scripture. Now listen, the amillennialist is the person who believes that the kingdom is an esoteric metaphor for the church. Good believers in Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, accept that or, or, or look at it that way and think, yeah, we are in the kingdom now. I'm an amillennialist, therefore there is no literal millennial kingdom. It's just a picture of the church and the church spreading out and growing in the world. Problem is the prophets say that the kingdom is first and foremost a promise to Israel. It's not a church promise. It's a Jew promise. And it is for Israel and must be fulfilled to Israel or the prophecy is false. The amillennialist is missing something here. The post-millennialist, another uh, belief system that, that's surprisingly growing in interest these days. I don't see how. The post-millennialist believes that Christ will come, but after the church has established his kingdom for him. We'll do the work. We will spread the message throughout the world. We will finally gain control of the world, bring it into the place of righteousness, and then we'll say, here you go, Lord, and we'll hand it to him, like on a silver platter. The world is exploding, I believe was the quote. I don't see it better now than even times it's been in the past. The prophets, the prophets were premillennialists. Every one of them. That is, they clearly taught that their Messiah himself would return and he would establish his kingdom as a premillennial event after the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Isaiah 59, verse 19. They will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. And so the kingdom is an event. It is a happening. It is a reality that Jesus will usher in and Jesus will rule and reign over after that time of Jacob's trouble. We're citizens of that kingdom. Don't get me wrong. You are a part of the kingdom right now. It's just that the kingdom isn't here yet. We're like pre-citizens by faith in Jesus Christ. We're a part of that. We will be in that. And there are certain serendipities of the kingdom we have right now. Peace that surpasses all comprehension. How can we in a world going haywire have such peace? Well, because I'm a citizen of the kingdom. It kind of comes with the visa. There's a calm about us. There's a joy that we shouldn't have. There's a love that does not belong in this world. And all of these are kingdom characteristics that belong to those who have the Spirit of Christ who is the King of the coming kingdom. 
Kingdom's not a metaphor. Think about this. If, if we're in the kingdom right now, how disappointing is that? If the kingdom is a, a metaphor for the church today, again, disappointing. I mean, there's sorrow, and there's suffering, there's scorn. And while all of these things are going on, we're supposed to believe that this is the kingdom. I mean no disrespect, but if this is the kingdom, I don't want it. But the kingdom I read about in here, that's what I want. That's where my heart goes. That's where I believe the Lord is calling us. It's not a Disney animated feature. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be as real as the kingdom of Christ itself is real. And notice the position of the prophecy. Go back to chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. High places of a forest. That is an idolatrous thing. I shared this on Sunday. Right now, that mountain has sitting atop it an idolatrous thing. Okay, Rick, you're going to start the Muslim bashing. No, I'm not Muslim bashing. I'm just speaking the truth. In love. The dome of the rock is inscribed with blasphemy. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is an inciter of anti-Semitism. And these two edifices that are sitting right now on the Temple Mount are blasphemy to God and they are idolatrous in their teaching and what they lure people into. My heart goes out to the Muslim because the Muslim needs Jesus. But the truth is, Islam is idolatrous. And Zion was plowed as a field, wiped out. And then as they built back up on it, it was the Dome of the Rock put in there. And then again, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And now it's under this, this dark authority. But from the ashes of Zion's ruin comes a message of wonderful hope, and that is the glory of Zion. So note that. He comes out of chapter 3 and goes right into chapter 4, which I think is is wise uh, literature. He comes from the downside of Zion to the glory of Zion and begins to talk about it. Twice, twice the Jewish people saw their beloved Zion plowed. Twice they saw it ruined. But the Lord now looks beyond that to the kingdom. And in verse 2 he says, Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that He may teach us about His ways, and that we may walk in His paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now Micah begins to teach us some things about this kingdom. And the first thing he lands with is Zion's prince. Zion's prince. For in the actual Jerusalem, in the literal kingdom, we have the presence of the prince, and he is Zion's glory. The glory of Zion is Jesus Christ. Present there, and immediately we recognize three aspects of this, of this prince. He's ruler, he's rabbi, and he's righteous judge. He's ruler. Verse 2 tells us, for from Zion will go forth the law. And as far as I can understand, he who makes the rules is the ruler. He who gives the law is the one in charge. And Jesus now is bringing forth the law from Zion. He's the ruler. Secondly, he's the rabbi. The nations go up to Zion to be taught by the Lord. Can you even imagine one of those Bible studies? What would that be like? Step out of the metaphor and into the reality, gang. The nations will stream to Jerusalem to be taught by Jesus. Wow. I've told you all before, my favorite place to teach in all the world is in Israel. And in Israel is in Jerusalem. And in in Jerusalem, it's on the southern steps of the temple. I love to go there and teach. But to sit there and listen to Jesus teach, it blows my mind. From Paul to Irenaeus... From Spurgeon to Tozer to McGee to any Bible teacher that perhaps you listen to or, or, or love to hear. Listen, none of them teach like Rabbi Yeshua. 
none of them can come close. And to sit and to listen to Him and to soak... You know, this world has go, gone so far off path that our rabbit trails have become major highways. <laughs> we reside in these places now. But in the kingdom, the nations go up to Zion. Got a problem? Go to Zion. Got an issue? Talk to Jesus. Confused? Distressed? Let's go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord and let's listen to Jesus. Let's get our answers there. You know, I I, I keep coming back to this verse. Forgive me if I'm repeating myself. But as we approach the the move into the new building over and over and over I can't get out of Luke chapter 10 verses 41 and 42 and I just hear Jesus saying this only he doesn't say Martha Martha he says Rick Rick you are worried and bothered about so many things only one thing is necessary remember what he said he said Mary has chosen the better part Mary who was just sitting there listening to Jesus and I get this sense of being in Zion listening to Jesus And tonight, if you're worried, and if you're bothered about many things, let me just remind you, you don't have to wait for the kingdom to be taught by Jesus. All you have to do is pray. All you have to do is open His Word. And He said in John 14, 26, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Zion's prince, he is the ruler and he's the rabbi and he's the righteous judge. Verse 3. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. And then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. When peace is based solely on the goodness of man, there ain't going to be no peace. It is an absolute impossibility. As a matter of fact, peace by disarmament is complete stupidity. Those who would say, all we need to do is disarm and the world will follow suit, do not understand the nature of man, which is basically bad. No offense. They do not understand the sin nature. Hey, you can drop your weapons and say, I refuse to fight. Or like the the, the famous old Native American saying, remember this, I will fight no more forever. Yeah, you'll be on a reservation. To try and take a stand for peace by saying, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, put all the weapons away and it'll be good. It won't be good. It can't be good. Why? Sin nature. There will always be an ISIS. There will always be a Saddam Hussein. There will always be someone trying to stir it up in this world. The only way a nation can safely disarm with the assurance of absolute peace will be when the Prince of Peace is at hand. When the ruler, the rabbi, and the righteous judge are present. Only when Jesus is here. Only when Jesus resides in Zion can we then take our swords and hammer them into plowshares. Then we can take every weapon ever conceived by man and we can do away with them because Jesus will be here. If you get some little Saddam Hussein style nut somewhere, Jesus will deal with him. And I don't have to worry about it. Psalm 96.13, He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness when Jesus is here. There's going to be peace. Which brings us now to the description of Zion's people. Of Zion's prince. Secondly, now we come to Zion's people. Verse 4. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. That's a great assurance. Though all the peoples walk, he say, says, in the name of of his God, and this is a good word, brothers and sisters, for us right now today. As for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. There are all kinds of 
beliefs in all kinds of false gods out there and many people turning in multiple spiritual directions today. As for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. And what is His name? Jesus Christ. And I will walk after Him. And it doesn't matter how many other gods are presented. And it doesn't matter how many people turn away. I will walk with Him. And that's the commitment that the people of God have, need to have. What's the big deal about everybody having their own fig tree and vine? Micah is describing here Zion's people at rest. And that's what the picture is there. Kind of taking, you know, a little a little nap in the afternoon under that vine, under that fig tree. Verse 4 is a reference to security and prosperity and peace. It's actually a proverb in ancient Israel, and it speaks of a peace that Israel has not known since the days of Solomon. The same phrase used in 1 Kings 4.25, Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan in the north all the way down to Beersheba in the south, all the days of Solomon. Everyone had a fig tree, everyone had a vine. Did they all? The point is, everyone was at peace and completely secure. When King Solomon was on the throne... And when we see Messiah the Prince come, there will be a return to this. Everyone will have rest. All of God's people, Zion's people, at rest. But it's interesting, Micah speaks of this, and then he starts to work his way backward from that. So ultimately, they're going to be in the place of rest. But what happens right before that? Verse 6. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. But as for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Before Zion's people can be at rest, Zion's people must be restored. Because restoration precedes rest. Restoration must come first. And their restoration is to Zion. I love how it's described in verse 8 as the tower of the flock. The tower of the flock. It, it literally means that your, uh, your margins may tell you what that says there. It's Migdal Adair. Migdal. Does Migdal sound familiar to anybody? Migdal is a little village there in the Galilee. The home of a woman named Mary from Migdal. Mary Magdalene. Mary from Magdala. And Migdal means tower. So Migdal Adair, tower of the flock. And it's a description of protection and security. Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 4 says, Your neck, the, the groom is speaking of his bride, Your neck is like the tower of David, built with rows of stones on which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. Now, I don't see that... As a good description for a woman, but I just don't understand the culture. That to me would be a little weird. Someone, a woman whose neck has you know, like shields on it. Something's not right. What's she hiding? I just want to know. And why is it so long that we're calling it a tower now? Anyway. But Song of Songs, what, what the, the groom is saying poetically there is she's beautifully secure. I see her neck as as this tower of of security and of of strength and of confidence. Cheryl was talking today about, uh, she was talking to Rachel about walking across Western campus at night and how you do that. You just walk with confidence. And then Cheryl showed me how you walk with confidence. And it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, honey, if you walk like that across a campus, you're sure to be in trouble. You know, she's like. But her, you know what was amazing? Her neck looked like a tower of David. I don't know. It speaks of confidence in the security of the Lord, and we have that right now. You and I, as the people belonging to Jesus, we have this confidence. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 says, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Confident, secure. I ask this from time to time. Are you secure in your salvation? 
please understand, Jesus has done everything necessary for every single one of us to be secure in our salvation. Not to be guessing, not to be wondering, not to be fearful that if He should come tonight, what if I'm not ready? If you have been born again, you have every reason to be secure in your salvation. He has bought it with His own blood. So trust Him for that. And go forward joyfully. And, and, and as I've said also before, don't focus on your salvation. Focus on the salvation of others now. You got yours. It's secure. Okay, don't worry about it. Focus on people who are lost. And let's love them. So the people are going to be at rest. But before they are at rest, they have to be restored back to Zion. But before the people are restored and at rest, there's something else that takes place. Zion's people writhe. I know that starts with a W, but it sounds like an R, so I think it works. Zion's people writhe. Verse 9. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion. Like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. The writhing of Zion, the writhing of the Jewish people began in Babylon 586 B.C. It has not ended. It has continued. In the years between Babylon and then the destruction in A.D. 70 by Rome, in the years in between, the people were writhing. They were in the midst of constant warfare, constant battles. Not so much among themselves, but armies coming from the north, armies coming from the south, meeting in Israel, and the people were just torn about, writhing as it were. Since A.D. 70, how has life been overall for the Jewish people? I don't even need to go into this because we've done it so many times. Writhing in labor. Verse 11, And now many nations have been assembled against you who say, Let her be polluted and let our eyes gloat over Zion. And we're watching it happen right now. Because the people of Zion, though they will one day be at rest... And before that be restored, are currently writhing in labor. But he says writhe in labor as in labor pains. Hasn't there been a birth? And we've talked about this. Hasn't there been a a, a rebirth of the nation of Israel? Doesn't that count for something? Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8. Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed... She also brought forth her son. So there has been a writhing in labor that has produced now the nation of Israel. I believe the fulfillment of Isaiah 66 verse 8 in our generation, a stunning moment. The nation born in a day, the land born all at once. And yet, Zion continues to writhe. The nation of Israel continues to writhe. Rockets from Hamas. Threats from Iran or the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Think about this. What do you think is the real purpose of establishing an Islamic caliphate from Syria all the way over and across to Iraq? What do you think is their prime directive? It is to take out Israel. It's not just that they want that land. Israel's next. I guarantee you Israel is in the sights of the Islamic State. Israel is writhing, and they're in the midst of this really bad neighborhood. I'd move. (laughs) But they can't because they're home. And they know they're where they're supposed to be, even if they haven't fully understood all that that means, all that it entails. And pour in the anti-Semitic rhetoric that continues to spew in our world, and you have a writhing problem for a people who are still laboring under the law. Verse 12. But they, and they here speaks of the nations who gloat over Israel, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. And they do not understand His purpose, for He has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. The sheaves that don't get it are the nations of the world and the threshers are Israel. Watch this. Verse 13. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. For your horn 
I will make iron, and your hoofs I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. The picture here is of an ox that is being used for threshing. An ox, the daughter of Zion, with an iron horn and bronze hoofs stomping the gloating nations. Interesting. And what this points to, verse 13, is that in the kingdom, Israel will be the singular superpower of the world. With Jesus ruling and reigning from there. You see, the Bible tells us there are multiple nations in that millennial kingdom. The nations are going to go up to Zion to worship the Lord, right? So among all these nations, there is one great nation, and it is the nation of Israel, and it is the great power, it is the superpower in those days. Psalm 2, verse 9, speaking of the king of that kingdom, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. And do homage to the Son, that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Zion's prince. And Zion's people. And now number three, Zion's peace. Zion's peace, chapter 5. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. And then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 5, Isaiah calls him the prince of peace. And Paul draws on this very prophecy, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, saying, He Himself, Jesus, is our peace. He is peace incarnate. This is one of the greatest prophecies in the entire Jewish Bible. Right here, the first five verses of Isaiah chapter, or Micah chapter 5. The minor prophet gives a major prophecy. And he comes along speaking of Bethlehem Ephrathah, place of Jesus' birth, that little town six miles south of Jerusalem, the house of bread, Bethlehem. And Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, confirms it. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, confirms it. John chapter 7, verse 48, confirms Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus. And we're going to talk about this more on Sunday. In fact, I'm going to save these five verses to really dig into on Sunday morning. But i got to say this much. Bethlehem Ephrathah, Too little even to be numbered among the clans of Judah. In fact, Bethlehem is not even listed in Joshua 15, where Judah's clans are are laid out. Nor is it listed in Nehemiah 11, where again, the clans are laid out. It's not even listed. It's too little. Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And the reason why the Ephrathah is there is because there was more than one Bethlehem. So God wanted to make sure we knew it was the right one. And that the one Jesus was born in was the exact, precise Bethlehem. Not the other one, but Bethlehem Ephrathah. Again, more about that on Sunday. But note this about Jesus, the prince of coming Zion. He was not born among the Caesars of Rome. And he wasn't born among the great philosophers of Athens. He wasn't even born among the priests of Jerusalem. He was born in the house of bread. Tiny little Bethlehem. Among the sheepfolds and the shepherds among a most common people in a very common place. And I love that Jesus was born there. This last spring we stood there in what they call the shepherd's fields. And we talked about this. And it was just stunning to me because it is so humble and simple. 
And if there's anyone in the world who would say, God can't possibly understand me, he's too great, all you got to do is look at Bethlehem. Well, I've said too much. We'll come back to it. <laughs> Continuing on in verse 5, when the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples on our citadels, then we will rise against him or raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. And they will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land and when he tramples our territory. Hmm. Okay. What's going on with this Assyrian? Number four in your notes as we're going through Zion's prince, Zion's people, Zion's peace, and now Zion's protection. Zion's protection. Assyria was broken. It was crumbling, but it was broken in 609 B.C. Assyria has never risen to the power that it was once at again. 609 B.C., it was taken out. Mighty Babylon took over, just as the Lord said was going to happen. Back through Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. Just as I have planned, so it will stand, to break Assyria in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains, and then his yoke will be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulder. It really began, Assyria's breaking, falling apart, crumbling, it began when they tried to take out Jerusalem. And Hezekiah. And Isaiah, and perhaps Micah, although we don't know, but he was in the land at the time, began to pray and lay it out before the Lord for protection and call on the Lord for their safekeeping. While they were surrounded by 185,000 Assyrians besieging Jerusalem, and you know, the next day after this prayer, there were 185,000 corpses surrounding Jerusalem. That was the beginning of the end of Assyria. Now, historians may not tell you that, but the Bible does. It started there, and by 609 B.C., Assyria was wiped out. But understand this. We're talking about Jesus. Okay, He is the one of the prophecy born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And in the context of that, He is the one who will be our peace in the coming kingdom. So it's a forward-looking prophecy. And suddenly, Micah says, when the Assyrian invades our land, He will deliver us from the Assyrian. He is talking about Jesus. He is referring to Jesus in the coming kingdom. But Assyria was wiped out 2,600 years ago. Who's the Assyrian? What's He talking about here? Micah is given this prophecy and what the Lord instructs him to do is look around at the greatest world power dominating the world in his day. And it was Assyria. When Micah wrote this, Assyria was the dominant nation. Assyria either had just wiped out northern Israel or was about to. Micah sees all of this and grabs a hold of a picture of a world dominating leader. A superpower, as it were, led by a super politician. And I believe that the Assyrian here is another name for Antichrist. And that's what he's talking about. And note, it's interesting because he also says they will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod at its entrances. What's the land of Nimrod? Babylon. Babylon, which the book of Revelation tells us is HQ for Antichrist. Let me give you something else just to chew on based on what we see happening right now in the Middle East. Assyria was made up of what is two nations today. Know what they are? Syria and Iraq. Who is dominating the world scene in Syria and Iraq right now? The Islamic State. ISIS. That's interesting. How does that play in? I would instruct you to go read Psalm 83 and give it some thinking. Chew on that a little bit. I'm not going to do it tonight. But what we're talking about here is the power of Jesus to subdue all the enemies of Israel. And the Assyrian in that picture may very well be then Antichrist and his horde coming down upon Israel in massive attack for the battle there at Armageddon. Armageddon. And that fight taking place until Jesus comes down in his glory. They turn, they look at him. Daniel chapter 11 describes the whole epic battle, and he is done. 
Antichrist is put down. Now it says that they will have seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. What is that talking about? It refers to a full company of shepherd leaders under the authority, the lordship of Messiah. So is it just seven and eight? It's, it's that biblical uh, language, that poetic language. Seven is the number of completion. Eight just takes it one step further. Remember, I believe it was Amos who would use the phrase for three sins and for four. Well, this is the same idea for seven and for eight. We're talking about a complete complement, a full company of leaders. It's indicating there's more than enough. Messiah's government will have more than enough power to subdue all the forces of Antichrist and to put him away. And according to Micah, the Lord extends this power to his people. Verse 7, then the remnant of Jacob will be among many peoples. And then he describes in two ways, like dew from the Lord. Showers on vegetation which do not wait for man or delay for the sons of man. And the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many peoples, like a lion. Among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion, among flocks of sheep, which, if he passes through, tramples down and tears, and there is none to rescue. Your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries, and all your enemies will be cut off. And it's an amazing picture he gives. Two, two things that would, you would think would be incompatible, really, uh, to describe someone as dew and a lion. And yet Micah does. The people of Israel, that remnant, are going to be like dew. Like dew that is refreshing and rejuvenating. The resplendent work of the Holy Spirit as He comes rushing through the remnant to the parched world. And I even wonder if perhaps there's, there's some thinking about that 144,000 Jews who will be spreading out among planet Earth with the message of the gospel in a mission work that's bigger than anything we're seeing today. That the people of Israel will be like dew on a parched land. And note when he refers to the dew, he says, it does not wait for men or delay for the sons of man. What does that mean? It means the dew, the refreshment, doesn't come from the Lord because man expects it to. But because God wills it. Who in the first century expected God to show up on planet Earth? They could have. Perhaps you might say they should have if they were reading the scriptures. Some were expectant. Anna, Zacharias, there in Jerusalem. There were a few who were expecting. But for the most part, mankind was not expecting any grace from God at that time. God just willed it. And so will the second coming of Jesus be. There will not be an expectation People will be caught off guard. They will be surprised. He's coming at a time when we do not think He will. But He's coming. And for those who are waiting for Him, even if we are a bit surprised, we will be refreshed. But Israel also comes on like a lion, verse 8. They will be empowered like no other nation. And I guarantee you, no one will think twice about messing with Israel in the Millennial Kingdom. No one's going to be lobbing rockets from Gaza in those days, I promise you. And while all this protective power expands beyond the land, the Lord Messiah does something remarkable. Number five, Zion's purification. Verse 10. It will be in that day, declares the Lord, that I will just cut off from your, I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots. I will also cut off the cities of your land and tear down all your fortifications. I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you will have fortune tellers no more. I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you, so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will root out your Asherim from among you and destroy your cities, he says, Zion's purification. And what he describes here in these few verses is anything... And everything relied upon by Israel, both in the past and right now, other than the Lord himself. Anything Israel leans on, God's going to remove. Anything Israel trusts in, aside from the Lord, he's taken out. He's going to clean house. There will be no power of weaponry. Jesus will remove Demona. The power plant, the nuclear plant that Israel doesn't have, but that they have. 
<laughs> he's going to remove all weapons. There will be no need for him because he's there, verse 10. He will remove all fortresses and fortifications, verse 11. There will be no fortress cities to protect the land. Why? Unnecessary. He's going to remove them. And there's not going to be any sorcery or fortune telling, verse 12. No idolatry or human craftsmanship, verses 13 and 14. No cities at all devoted to anything, to any power, but the power of Messiah. Now... I was reading this and I was thinking, when the Jews came back from Babylon, idolatry ceased. That ceased to be a problem in Israel. And all the way to the coming of Jesus, the only real idolatry was the temple itself. That was the only thing that the people were really trusting in. But they, didn't. they had put away the Asherim. They put away the Baals. They were not trusting in the idolatry of the nations. They had enough in Babylon. They learned their lesson. But here he says... In that day, when Jesus returns, he's going to be removing things from the land. And part of what he removes is fortune tellers, sorceries, carved images. I thought that wasn't an issue in Israel anymore. All you got to do is walk in a few gift shops in Israel today and you will see it's an issue. One of the things that people have asked me many times about there is the Hamza hand. The Hamza hand, it's, it's an amulet, it, it, little necklaces, keychains, hands, they, p- people put them on their doors, all kinds of things. And it's from the Hebrew Chamesh, which is the number five, Chamesh. The Hamza hand, and it's a hand that I can't even do it right, but the three fingers in the middle are straight up, and then the pinky and the thumb look like about the same, and they kind of curve outward. And usually in the middle of this amulet, there's an eye. And the whole point of the Hamza hand is it's a talisman that is to ward off the evil eye. (laughs) Okay, it's kind of that Yiddish thing, and no one knows really where it came from. It's not from ancient Israel, and it's not Arabic, although it's popular among Arabs as well. And there are those who think maybe it even predates it. It goes back further, that it's some kind of a pagan symbol the eye in the middle of the hand, the Hamza hand, you can buy it all over Israel today. In Messiah's kingdom, that will be lacking in the gift shops. You know, Ben will still be able to get some cool Israel, you know, established 1948 sweatshirts, that kind of thing. But the Hamza hand will be gone because Messiah promises to purify Israel. He has to because he's going to be there. And Messiah cannot be where things are not purified. He has to purify the land. He's coming to do that. And by the way, Micah's second message ends with a global warning. I will execute vengeance in anger and wrath on the nations which have not obeyed. All these things are coming. The kingdom of Zion. Zion's prince, Zion's people, Zion's peace, Zion's protection, Zion's purification, along with the final punishment of the globe that stands in rebellion to Jesus Christ. Messiah's presence requires purification. You cannot have Jesus present where things are not pure. There is no Messiah the prince without purification. Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. He's talking about the government of the kingdom. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And yes, I separate Wonderful and Counselor into two names. I'll tell you why another time. There will be no end, listen, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. The increase of his government guarantees the increase of peace. But where there is not his government, there is not his peace. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying that while the interpretation is literal, there will be an increasing government of Christ and there will be the increase of peace throughout the millennial kingdom and on into eternity. There is a spiritual application for us. 
that you will not have peace in your life unless you have the government of Jesus Christ sanctifying and purifying. We can't know peace unless we have purification. When the world says holiness is boring, when the world says righteousness sounds dull, Jesus says, no, no, it's in holiness and righteousness and purification that you have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. Titus 2 verse 13 says we are to be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And we talk about that a lot. But listen to the next verse. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Sunday we talked about the world system versus Messiah's kingdom. Those are the two options. But brothers and sisters tonight, right now, in practice and in practicality, does Messiah govern your little kingdom? The kingdom of your heart. The kingdom of my mind. The kingdom of my body. Is Jesus governing? Am I allowing Him to purify? You might ask the question, am I at rest under the ruler's staff? Am I being restored in the rabbi's teaching? Am I being sanctified, purified by the righteous judge? Or am I writhing in labor like Israel? Am I working it? Still trying to birth something that the Lord has already birthed in me? These are just things to think through. And the government of Jesus is a very real and very practical thing for His kingdom citizens right now before kingdom come to the world to allow the kingdom to come to my heart and give Jesus His rightful place of authority for He is our peace. He will rise and shepherd His flock. Chapter 5, verse 4, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord His God, They will remain because at that time He will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. And may He arise in your heart tonight and have complete authority and govern heart, mind, and body. Amen? Father, we look forward to Your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we welcome Your return. But we accept right now, tonight. And if you accept this, you just say amen in your heart to the Lord. We accept your governing authority right now. Lord Jesus, we accept your desire to purify our hearts right now. And we recognize that perhaps the reason why sometimes peace is elusive is because we are impure. Oh, Jesus, sanctify your people. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. And pour out your Holy Spirit to keep us clean before you as we look for and long for your coming kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen.